Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see you all here. As Am said, I'm here representing Van City as a board member. And I'd like to welcome you all to what promises to be a very engaging, very interesting evening. I have had the benefit of hearing both professors speak uh, when I attended at Bologna, and it was just a fantastic, fantastic experience. Before I begin or go much further, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathering in the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, and that includes the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations, who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years. This also is where Van City does its business, where our branches are located, and where our members live and work. I'd like to also extend a thank you to Am Johal and the Office of Community Engagement at SFU Woodwards, as well as the support of the Instituto Italiana di Cultura, that's the Italian Institute of Culture, and our media sponsor, the TAI. With our partners, SFU and the Instituto di Cultura, Van City Credit Union is delighted to be presenting this special evening because it resonates so closely with us. We are a cooperative. We're a financial cooperative. And we're grounded in the local economy. What this means is that we are owned and democratically controlled by our 490,000 members. We are interested in the sustainability and the longevity of our members and our local communities. Our vision is to redefine wealth. We see wealth as more than just money in a bank account. Redefining wealth is about building the financial, social, and environmental prosperity of our communities as a whole so that we can all be wealthy and resilient. Beyond growing the financial services that our members need and providing those services, we make loans and grants to organizations that have a positive impact in our community. As a financial cooperative, our, our values-based banking model allows us to compete in the market and strive to be profitable, but those profits in turn are used to benefit our members and our communities. Every year, we return 30% of our profits back to our members and back into our communities. Therefore, that means that we are doing good work, as are many other cooperatives in the Lower Mainland and in Cross British Columbia. And those cooperatives, as you know, provide work, they provide transportation, they provide services or health care and food to our members. All of this is creating a positive impact, but we want to make more changes and we want to have a bigger impact. And this causes us to ask more questions. What else is possible? Could cooperatives play a bigger role in our economy? Could co-ops help to make our communities more sustainable and more socially inclusive? For inspiration and for guidance, we turn to Emilia Romagna. This region in northern Italy is the world's most significant cooperative economy. Their 5,400 co-ops account for fully one-third of the region's GDP and 15% of employment. These co-ops are providing high-paying employment in manufacturing, construction, and other sectors. The agricultural co-ops are raising the economic value of farming, and the social cooperatives are providing a wide range of health and social services. In this remarkable region, even non-co-op businesses cooperate in order to compete internationally. The result is a society that is marked by high levels of trust and social capital. This is a competitive advantage in good times and an absolute necessity in challenging times. This is why it's so important for us to collaborate and to learn from these cooperatives in Italy. So, for a dozen years, Van City has sponsored an annual study tour to the region. Since 2009, some 70 staff and board members, including myself, have benefited from and learned about what makes a cooperative economy possible. The intellectual framework, the infrastructure, and the passion necessary to create space in the marketplace. These learnings are having a profound effect on your credit union. 
and that education would not be possible without Professor Stefano Zamani. It's no exaggeration to say that he is the world's leading uh, academic on cooperative economics. He is the former dean of the economics faculty. He's currently a professor of economics at the University of Bologna and an adjunct professor of international political economy at John Hopkins University Bologna Center, as is his wife, Vera Zamani, who will be introduced later today. We could spend all night noting Professor Zamani's affiliations and publications. For example, along with numerous papers, he has authored and co-authored several books, including Family and Work, Dictionary of the Civil Economy, Cooperative Enterprise Facing the Challenge of Globalization, and A History of Economic Thought. We are humbled that between teaching economics at the University of Bologna and the International Political Economy at John Hopkins University Bologna Center, and little projects like writing the Pope's encyclical on the social economy, Professor Zemani finds time for Van City somehow. And without further delay, please join me in a very warm welcome of Professor Stefano Zamani. Thank you very, very much. I am particularly happy to be with you in this occasion. So let me express my gratitude to our my friends of Van City and uh, of Simon Fraser University. Uh, I could perhaps re remind uh, myself, this is my fifth visit to Vancouver. The first one occurred in 1999. And since then, uh, the connection between uh, you see, our university in Bologna and Simon Fraser, and in particular Van City, has increased over time. So that is uh, why I am particularly grateful for this invitation this year and uh, a possibility to exchange some view with you on a topic which is rather huge, as you can imagine. So I will uh, enter into my argument from a, a consideration, which is the following. It is uh, universally taken for granted that today there is no alternative to a market economy. As we know, until a quarter of a century ago, that was not the case. Before the collapse of the Berlin Wall, some people in different parts of the world were thinking that a, a centrally planned economy would have been a better alternative to a market type of economy. Now we know that uh, that type of uh, assumption is uh, no longer tenable because uh, the centrally planned mold uh, disappeared apart from few cases such as North Korea or perhaps Cuba. So it is a fact that there is no real incredible alternative to market economy. But that does not mean that uh, the end of the history, or better to say the end of the debate, because uh, we should know that there are different models of market economy. All of them share the fundamental elements of a market economy. Just as a footnote, we know that the market economy was born in the 14th, 15th century. So it has a long history behind it. And it, we have also to consider that the market economy was a, an incredible way, invention to civilize. I, initially, the market economy was born in order to civilize as a, an instrument of civilization, and that was the case. But over time, over the centuries, the last five, six centuries, market economy went through different types of models, and that is the object of debate nowadays. So nobody questioned the existence of a market economy, but we should debate and discuss which type of model of the market economy fits our necessities, our hopes, our needs, etc. Now, to be synthetic and uh, uh, to be essential, so to speak, uh, we can distinguish between three models. One is what is called uh, the so-called neoliberal market economy. The second model is called uh, the social market economy. And the third one is called uh, the civil market economy. So I repeat, all three share the fundamental elements of a market economy, such as division of labor, 
such as uh, the notion of development, such as the notion of free enterprise. These are the three basic pillars of any type of market economy. But given that, we can dis differentiate the three models. Now, there are many ways of characterizing the three models. And let me stress that the three models are associated to different cultural matrices. In general, people associate the neoliberal market economy to the U.S. cultural metrics, even though it, we have to admit there are many scholars, many intellectuals, even in these days in the U.S., that uh, are rather critical in, uh, vis a vis the neoliberal market economy. The social market economy is usually associated to Germany because it is true that it was German during the interwar period, but above all after the Second World War, which uh, uh, developed the foundations and the empirical application of the social market economy. And nowadays, for instance, uh, if you read the, the Treaty of the European Union, or the Constitution, or better to say the treaty, in the Treaty of the European Union, it's written, the European Union adopt the model of social market economy. Finally, the third model, the civil market economy. That is a model which um, enjoyed a high consideration reputation in the, let's say, distant past. Until the end of the 18th century, that was the model of a market economy. But since then, it, in a sense, disappeared. And uh, the reason why I'm talking about uh, that model uh, as well as the other two is because in the last few years or couple of decades, this uh, third model is uh, re-emerging. And uh, we have to ask ourselves, why is that so? Which kind of reasons? justify a new interest in the civil market economy. But before answering that question, I think it's proper to, uh, to spend a few words to characterize the three models. If the question is, what is the, the fundamental difference between the three models? The, there are many ways to answer this question. Perhaps uh, the simplest is to refer to the three modes of regulation of transaction, of economic transaction. In other words, uh, if we generalize a bit our discourse and we ask, which modes do we know to regulate uh, tr economic, economic and financial transactions? One mode uh, has to do is called the free market model. A second mode uh, is called uh, the government model, and the third is called the governance model. Now, where is the difference between the three? It's uh, in the underlying uh, principle. The free market mode is based upon the principle of competition. And everybody knows more or less what is competition. Because in our societies, uh, we get to learn about competition right from the beginning when we are children. Uh, the idea of competition is that uh, uh, what economists uh, would describe in terms of demand and supply, the, the law of demand and the supply, the equilibrium condition, different market structure, etc. The model of, uh, sorry, the mode of uh, uh, what I call the government is based on another principle, which is the principle of authority. The mode of government is characterized by the hierarchical principle, not the, the, which is a vertical, not a horizontal. In other words, in the model of government, there is a, an authority which can be identified with the federal government or provincial government. Never mind. That depends uh, on the type of analysis one is carrying on. And uh, we attribute to that authority the capacity to take decisions and to implement them. The third mode is called governance. And the mode of governance is characterized by different principles, which is the principle of cooperation. Now, the point then is that the three models of market economy I, I've been talking about a few minutes ago are connected in a one-to-one -one way to the three modes. What I call the neoliberal model of market economy 
It's a, that model which tends to give a more and more emphasis to the free market mode. In other words, the principle of competition has to, uh, to be applied everywhere, in the, every area of economic or interpersonal relations. Of course, even the neoliberal would not exclude the government. But for the neoliberal, government has to be minimal. That is the notion of minimal state that perhaps uh, uh, in this part of, uh, of the world is more known than in Europe. But the minimal state says the government should exist, but only is supposed to do few fundamental things. If we recall the famous speeches by Ronald Reagan or in England by Margaret, Margaret Thatcher, uh, that we understand what does it mean uh, neoliberal mode. In other words, uh, the area of economic affairs should be ruled by the competition and so by the aim of efficiency. On the other hand, if we consider the model which I call social market economy, tends to give more and more emphasis to government. To government. In other words, that is in a sense typical of the German cultural metrics. In other words, you need an authority which we can identify with the government to which we people, citizens, surrender part or sometimes an important part of their, let's say, liberty, of their decision-making process, because it is believed that the government can do better than individual relations, etc. So a social market economy is a model of market economy where a great emphasis is attributed to the government. Again, that does not mean that the free market uh, is not put into, taken into consideration, but is, in a sense, infra, um, it's under the control, so to speak, uh, of the government. Finally, the civil market economy is uh, linked uh, to the third mode uh, of uh, uh, transaction, regulation of transaction, namely what I call the governance, the principle of uh, cooperation. Governance, which is a word that nowadays is used in many, in many different contexts, most of the time not in an appropriate way. I use governments in the technical sense. Governments principle means that a civil society should be able to organize itself in one way or the other, giving a, a generating organization of one type or the other, and it is a believed that this organization can obtain certain targets better than the government and the free market. Of course, even the civil market economy would admit the importance of the government and the importance of the free market. But it's a matter of considering a different balance between the three elements. In other words, to use a word which is extensively adopted in Europe, a bit less here in this part of the world, because for you it's taken for granted, is the principle of subsidiarity. The governance model tends to transform into practice the subsidiarity principle, vertical, horizontal, circular, subsidiarity, etc. Now, having clarified that, the point then is, why today today I mean in the last couple of decades, a growing attention is attributed to the civil market economy, which means is attributed to the governance principle, which is not a substitute, but tends to take more and more relevance. And within that, why today we observe a growing importance of that particular particular type of enterprise which we call cooperatives. We should remind ourselves that a bit less than uh, one billion people in the world are members of cooperatives. So mass media never mentioned this, these facts, and that it's a pity, because truth has to be told, irrespective of the judgment that one passes on a certain piece of evidence. It has been calculated by the International Cooperative Alliance, that 900 million people are members 
of a cooperative of one type or the other in more than 90 countries. So the cooperative movement is not something which belongs to a particular tradition or to a particular continent, because it's spread in many different areas of the world. Second, the, the derivative, as we say in mathematics, in other words, the rate of growth of cooperatives in the last 20 years in different parts of the world is increasing more rapidly than other forms of enterprises. So now the question is why that is occurring. To answer this question, it's proper to consider what a typical feature of our societies today. Namely, it's a, we live in a society characterized by many paradoxes, unknown to the previous epochs. In other words, uh, as you know, paradox is a Greek word. Paradox in Greek means surprise, something that uh, we would not expect uh, and it occurs. So that is the proper meaning of the word paradox. So what are the paradoxes uh, of today I'm talking about, which uh, are different from the paradoxes of the previous times, three in particular. The first one has to do with the fact that whereas the income or riches in general is increasing at the world level, inequalities are increasing more than in proportion. That something, this is something that is a paradox. In other words, um, there was um, an important economist who got the Nobel Prize, he passed away already many years ago. His name was Kuznets, Simon Kuznets, Simon Kuznets, American, even though he came from another country. And he created a curve which uh, today is never taught in our classes in the university. And that is uh, significant. But I, when I was a student, I was a student in Oxford a long time ago, you see, I remember my professor saying, today we have to talk about the Kuznets curve. The Kuznets curve is a curve like that. In a horizontal axis of a diagram, you put uh, the rate uh, of uh, increase uh, of income per capita. And uh, on the vertical axis, you put uh, the Gini coefficient. Gini coefficient is a statistical measure after the name of an Italian statistician whose name was Gini, Corrado Gini, which is used to measure inequalities, social inequalities uh, within a social group or a, or a nation or a region, whatever. Now, Kuznets obtained a curve, which took the name after him, which is a parabolic form, like a parabola. A curve first uh, de increasing and then decreasing. The meaning was the following. In the initial stages of growth, Inequality increases. The distance between rich and poor increases. But beyond a certain threshold, when the parabola reaches the top, the maximum, further increments of income per capita will diminish the inequality until, in the long run, the curve cuts the horizontal axis, which means uh, we will be in a society of full equality. Now, what was the implication of the Kuznets curve? Be careful that this curve played a major impact on political grounds. It was not a piece of theory. No, no, it was very much taken for serious because the implication was the following in the hands of the politicians or our political leaders. Don't worry about inequality. Because inequalities are doomed to disappear. It's only a matter of taking time. That is why few American uh, uh, scholars invented the aphorism, the so-called rising tide aphorism. I'm sure that you heard about that. Namely, a rising tide lifts all the boats. It's a beautiful aphorism, which means don't worry if there are somebody lagging behind. What is important is to have the tide rising because a rising tide will lift uh, all the boats so everybody at the end will be more or less uh, in a fair situation. Now we know that uh, this curve has been, uh, uh, has been ridiculized because the facts uh, 
are such that nobody today believes in the Kuznets curve. That is the reason why Kuznets curve has disappeared from the textbooks, not all of them, eh? but from the majority textbooks in macroeconomics. That is why our students never heard about that. Well, I go around in many different universities in different countries. I make these experiments, addressing students. I said, university students, I said, have you ever heard? No, nobody told us. That is revealing. Because, you see, that curve was used to justify a sort of irresponsibility towards issues of inequality. The result is that in the last 30 years, the inequality, as measured by the Gini coefficient, has increased more than in the previous 150 years. Now, this is a paradox. A paradox because we tend to believe that when income goes up, everybody should be better off. No, no, no. Because uh, it is the case that... Uh, as statistics nowadays confirms, that in the last few decades, uh, the position of those lagging behind has deteriorated. There is a, a recent piece of analysis by an economic historian. His name is Emmanuel Saez. And uh, Saez compared the situation of the 29th crisis with the present crisis. As you know, many economists keep on saying, this crisis is uh, as bad, as serious as the 1929 big crisis. It's not true. It's too ridiculous. You can't make this comparison because they are only based on nothing. What science, uh, science proved uh, was the following, that during the 29th crisis, the condition, the economic condition of everybody deteriorated. And the economic condition of the rich of that time deteriorated more than the economic conditions of the poor at that time. In this crisis, the present crisis, the opposite is true. The 15, 20% of the richest in this crisis has, in, has increased their condition, and the poor have even more decreased. So it makes a lot of difference. So we cannot continue to say nonsense, saying this crisis is like the previous one. Because in the, in the previous one, everybody got worse off. In this crisis, not everybody. And you know, there is no, no reason to make names, uh, to give names, but everybody knows that there are a group of people and companies which benefited from this crisis. Because from speculation, some people, let me call them the cunning people, obtain more and more income at the, at the detriment of the others. So now you understand why we live, this is a paradox. Because it's not true, as we used to believe in the past, that increasing income would benefit everybody. And so that is the first, uh, what's the connection between this remark and what I, the thesis I'm defending. The connection is the following. We need more cooperatives. Why? Because a cooperative is that strange animal within economics, which is such that the generation of income goes hand to hand with its distribution. Now, I do not want to enter into technicalities, but this idea was uh, initially understood by great mind, namely John Stuart Mill, great philosopher as well as great economist, uh, English, mid-19th century. His book was published uh, in the first edition, 1848, and in the third edition, 1855. And he already anticipated that, because he was very intelligent, but real intelligent, because intelligent people are those who have a vision and having a vision, they can, in a sense, anticipate the future events. He said, that if we really want to avoid the increasing degree of inequalities, we have to rely more and more on cooperatives, because John Stuart Mill was a great estimator of cooperatives. Now, I do not have with me, but I could quote certain passages from his important book. The title was Principle of Political Economy, where exactly says, uh, in the future, 
if mankind, I quote by heart, if mankind, mankind wants to improve, has to rely more and more on cooperatives. Why is that so? Because the cooperative firm is a firm where the income distribution inside, among the members of the, of the cooperative serves, cannot exceed a certain amount. That is simply, as simple as that. And th that is the reason, for instance, why in my country, those areas where there is a high presence of cooperative firms, there is less inequality than in other regions or other provinces of the country. The same is true in France, in Germany, in Spain, etc. So this is the first conclusion. We need more cooperatives because they tended to not equalize, eh, but to reduce inequalities. And uh, inequality reduction today is a must for every, even for neoliberals. Neoliberals, those economists who are neoliberals, but who are honest, intellectually honest, they admit. They are admitting that. Because you see, only somebody not okay could say inequality is good. Inequality is uh, it's right. Because you see, I mean, if one is intelligent, cannot make this statement. Because even the neoliberal originally, they said inequality has to be tolerated because in the long run it will disappear, Kuznets curve. That was an argument to be a, which needs to be respected. Now, the, honestly, the honest intellectual in neoliberals, they know that the Kuznets curve does not work, and so that is why. The point is that uh, they are they do not dare admitting that we need to change, not to change uh, in the sense of modifying the whole state, but to rebalance the presence within the market uh, setup of cooperative firms as well as capitalistic type of firm. So that is the first reason to speak in favor of my thesis. We need more cooperatives because uh, we cannot get along with such a, a tremendous, or I, I would say scandalous, increase of inequality. Because be careful that inequalities, when they overtake a certain threshold, become very dangerous, eh? even from a political point of view. Because in the past, revolutions always occurred because of an unsustainable level of inequalities. So if one is really liberal, which means uh, likes liberty, has to consider that. Second, oh, one could say, why not the government? Again, that is a good question. But the government nowadays, in the epoch of globalization, are necessary but not sufficient to obtain more equality. That is a point that escapes a, a certain number of economists. Because old-fashioned economists, they would say, well, let's give more power to the government. And no, because that was true yesterday, at the time when the economists were national economy. But today, we live in a globalized world. And the power of a national government cannot be extended outside the boundaries of the country. The Canadian gov federal government cannot impose rules uh, which has to be applicable to firms operating in other countries, etc. So that is why we need more cooperative, which uh, types of enterprises operating inside the market and which uh, obtain the result I described before. The second reason has to do with another, with another paradox of our society. That is the paradox uh, of, um, let's say, lack of democracy. Let me explain. We know the democratic principle, more or less, what is that about? The principle was... Uh, clearly defined already many centuries ago by Aristotle. Democracy is a Greek word, is a Greek word. And Aristotle was the first theoretician uh, on that ground. And uh, even nowadays, most of the times, we tend to believe that democracy is uh, something having to do with the political sphere, not with the economic sphere. That is uh, the most incredible mistake. Of course, the fault is how. 
is the fault of the intellectual, who kept on teaching this kind of separation theorem. The separation theorem says democracy has to be applied in the political sphere. Economics, or better to say the market sphere, has nothing to do with democracy because democracy is costly and within the, the, the market sphere we have to be efficient. Democracy is time consuming because under democracy we have to debate. In the market sphere, we have to take decisions in five minutes. Those who operate in the financial markets, they have to take decisions in one or two minutes before something otherwise will happen. So the argument was, okay, we love democracy in the political sphere. So multi-party system, free election, every four or five years, whatever, etc., etc. The market sphere has its own rules of the game, which do not contemplate democracy. And in fact, have you ever heard an economist when dealing with market theory talking about democracy? I never heard, never. I have read a certain number of books, never. Go and check. Because the argument is that market has its own rules, which have nothing to do with the democratic rule. Now, this separation theorem did not produce major disasters until recently when the national governments, in a sense, they had the power to control the market sphere. But what happened in the last quarter of a century? That the central governments, they are losing the power, the effective power to control the market sphere, in particular the financial markets. Look what happened in this crisis. Why this crisis occurred? Because our national governments were unable or incapable, according to the case, or not willing, according to the other case, to control the financial transaction. And then we obtained the results that we know. Consider the volume of derivatives, CDO, CDS, and hedge funds, etc. So now I come to the point. If we really love democracy in the political sphere, we should know that the po political democracy has to be sustained by economic democracy. Because unless the market itself becomes a democratic arena where the democratic principle applies, there is no way we run the risk of losing political democracy. And if one does not believe that, Try to pose and consider what happened in the last few years. Our Ministry of Finance or our Ministry of uh, Economy, whatever, they always have to rely before passing a, a decree or taking a decision, they have to conjecture what would happen, what will be the reaction of the markets. In this crisis, that was clearly evident, in particular in Europe. When uh, you see the spread, well, I said, uh, we cannot do that. We would like to do that, but we cannot. Why? Oh, because the markets, the financial market, will react uh, in that way, which means that uh, po political life, politics, is uh, now following uh, economics and not vice versa, as it was in the past. And uh, the great economists of the past, they always warned that, because the day that... Uh, politics follows economics, it's a very dangerous day because we run the risk of losing the democratic principle and we enter into dictatorial regimes. I keep on always, uh, uh, I keep on re remembering our experience when last November my wife and myself, we are invited in Korea, South Korea, eh? not North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. <laughs> And uh, we were invited last November because, you see, the Korean parliament passed the law the first time in their history. You know, the history of Korea, it's a fascinating history from different points of view. They passed the law authorizing the creation of cooperatives. The law entered into effect December the 1st of last year. 
No, so it, they used to come to Bologna the previous year to inquire, to know. We passed them uh, the Italian legislation in order to orient. And in fact, their law is, uh, technically speaking, very well done because they have, uh, I wouldn't say copy, but they have adapted the legislations of Canada, Italy, etc., to their own framework. So when we reached the Seoul, we asked, uh, but why have you decided to pass such a law. In other words, why a country like South Korea, which nowadays is the ninth industrial power in the world, ninth industrial power in the world, uh, uh, took the decision of opening your market to cooperative firms? You know what was the answer that we received? That was very instructive. We, in my opinion, this answer explains better than any other type of argument. The answer was, you know, professors, in this country, there is a, a dozen of big corporations, multinationals, such as Samsung, uh, yeah. and uh, this dozen of corporations, they generate almost 80% of the total GDP. So I said, ah, now I understand what you mean. And then they exemplified. They said, you see, we run the risk of becoming enslaved by those dozen corporations. Because if tomorrow the CEOs of the dozen corporations decide to shut down or to delocalize, we run the risk of disappearing. Because they generate almost 80% of the national GDP. So now we want cooperatives to become part of our market economy because we believe in a sort of rebalancing and in the respect, full respect of the rules of the market in order to counterbalance. Because we politicians, we have discovered that we run the risk of becoming a sort of a servants of the dozen multinationals. That was the answer last November which explain the point I'm making. So now, the second conclusion. You understand why do we need more cooperatives? Because cooperatives are democratic firm. In fact, what is the simplest way to define a cooperative? A cooperative is an enterprise which is democratic, which means an enterprise where the operating principle is one head, one vote. A capitalistic firm is non-democratic. Uh, we have to admit that. Because in a capitalistic firm, the rule is one share, one vote. And so if I have, I own one million shares, and you own one share, I count for one million, and you count for one. And which means, non -dem because democracy presupposes equality. When we go to vote in the political poll, the vote uh, of the most uh, genius has the same value as the vote of the last worker. So we need uh, to expand uh, the realm of democratic firms. Because otherwise, unless we reach a certain degree of economic democracy, the political democracy will run the, we jeopardize political democracy. And we shouldn't. We should not be superficial people like those who say, oh, who care less? Because when we lose political democracy, that is a, a, a nasty day, a very black day, and we want to avoid that. So that is the second reason, speaking in favor of the development of cooperative, because we need to democratize the market sphere. A market which is not democratic is not a good market, even though it is efficient. But we know that many people can die because of efficiency or super efficiency. Because efficiency is good, but it's not the only value. It's a value. I admit that, and I am in favor. But it's not the only value. Even democracy is another value. So that is the reason why we needed to balance the presence in our market setup of different types of enterprises. In other words, we need pluralism. 
in the same way as in the political arena, we need a multi-party system. In other words, uh, we need uh, more parties if we want democracy. In the same way, in the market sphere, we need uh, a multi-type of enterprises. In cooperative enterprises, social enterprises, capitalistic enterprises, and public enterprises, because there are also public enterprises, namely state-owned enterprises, which is okay, provided that pluralism is maintained. That is the second reason in favor of the thesis I am talking. Finally, I come to the third one. There is a third reason, which at least for me, I don't know for you, it's um, from a certain point of view even more fundamental than the other two. The third reason has to do with the issue of liberty. Now, you know that the notion of liberty is commonly uh, expressed with the famous phrase utilized uh, by Milton Friedman in his book published in 1962, Capitalism and Freedom. And the phrase is free to choose. Liberty means allowing everybody the possibility of free, freedom of choice. Freedom of choice, free to choose. Okay, but that is not enough. What we have to consider that free to choose is not enough. We, add, we have to add free to be able to choose. That is a lot. Why m many intellectuals uh, mystify on that? Because they never clarify the difference and it goes to the great merit of Amartya Sen, the economist um, everybody knows, Nobel Prize, uh, and uh, he teaches in Harvard still, in spite of his uh, 80 years, he continues to teach, etc. And his last book, uh, The Idea of Justice, is uh, really a, a, a masterpiece on that. And he says, uh, we have to de differentiate, because I can be free to choose, but still, I, can, I cannot be free to be able to choose. So this is the point. The point is that uh, if we love freedom or liberty, we have to be clear that it's not enough to guarantee freedom of choice. But we have to guarantee the freedom to be able to choose. Otherwise, that uh, it will be only a negative freedom. We want positive freedom which means freedom of, not only freedom from, or liberty from, from coercion. We need freedom of being able to realize our potential, our aspirations, our preferences. So now the point is the following. We know that human beings are different in terms of preference structure or in terms of their motivational system. We know that. Because the game theory, or better to say, experimental economics has, uh, in the last uh, 30 years, given us a lot of evidence, empirical evidence, that there are some people who are motivated by extrinsic uh, motivation. Other people are mainly motivated by intrinsic motivation. And we should respect everybody. There are some people who say, for me, the enjoyment of life is to accumulate more and more money. Other people will say, no, for me, enjoyment of life means uh, having more and more relational goods. Other people will say, for me, the maximum of life consists in uh, maximizing utility. Other people will say, we want to maximize happiness. And happiness is different from utility. Now, we have to, if we are serious people, to respect everybody. I would never say to somebody who is a home economicus, you know who is home economicus. A home economicus is an individualist and self-interested. If somebody is individualist and self-interested, technically speaking, that is called home economicus. I have nothing to object against home economicus, provided that that fellow says, I am home economicus. I dislike those people who do not dare 
admitting that, but they want to manipulate uh, the, the theory in such a way as to make people believe uh, that uh, that is the only pattern. But at the same time, we have to admit that there are people who are not homo economicus for their own reasons. Some people have intrinsic motivations, other they have mainly extrinsic motivations, and so on and so forth. So now the point is the following. If we accept this approach of granting freedom in the proper sense of the word, respecting preference structure of everybody, we have to admit that the possibility should be given to everybody to work in the type of firm or the type of organization which fits better its or her own preference structure. That is the point. In other words, to be even more, let's say, explicit, suppose I, for my own reasons, I am not homo economicus. I dislike the homo economics behavior. Okay? Why should I be compelled as it is today, in order to earn my life, because I need to eat, to earn some income. Why should I be compelled to work in a type of firm which is based on the assumption of home economicus when I dislike that? Do you accept that? I do not accept. That is against the principle of liberty, in the full sense. So that is why we need the plurality of firms. If I am not an home economic, I prefer to work in a cooperative firm. Because in a cooperative firm, it is obvious that individualism does not apply and there is no self interest Because as you know, a cooperative firm is not profit maximizing firm. A cooperative firm usually tends to maximize the social dividend, what is called social dividend, or pursuing other targets, social targets. And everybody should be left free. So now the point is, I observe that in, my, in the places where I work with students, when they graduate. You see, a, a considerable number of those students said, Professor, we would not like to go and work in a speculative bank, for instance. Because, uh, not because we, but because uh, our, let's say, frame of mind or the education that we have received at home or in other places is such that we will not feel happy to work in a speculative firm. But since I have no other alternative, and since I have to live or to sustain children, then I have to accept that job. Now, do you, do you consider that this is something acceptable? No, that is in me, to me, is intolerable. Because that means not respecting the principle of liberty. It's useless to say, oh, but you will be well paid. Because some people say, that is not my target of life. I prefer to work in a place where I am treated as a human being, not humiliated, not ridiculized, where there, are, there is no positional competition. You know what is positional competition? But I prefer cooperative competition. And so why should we exclude that to, to occur? So that is the third reason why we need pluralism within our market economy. Pluralism of types of enterprise. So everybody chooses. There are some people, and I have some students, very brilliant, eh? very brilliant, very intelligent. They said, Professor, for me, my purpose of life is to accumulate money, money, money. Because I, I am greed. I am greedy. <laughs> and to these people, I, always, I never say you should not do that. Never. I respect. And then when they ask me a recommendation letter, I write a recommendation letter. And to go to be, you know, when you have to be hired by important uh, organization, they ask you referential or recommendation letter. And usually uh, they obtain. I had a recent case, one from Bologna, who, for his reason, he wants to accumulate. He now works in, in New York, at Wall Street, in one of the major top uh, banks. And uh, year after year, from time to time, so he gets in touch with me, and I ask him, dear so-and-so, are you now happy that you are accumulating? 
And in the last telephone call, she said, not so much, because I'm realizing that I have, I'm having too much money, but I cannot enjoy it, because I have to work every day, even on Saturday and Sunday, because he's working, as you know, he's running an econometric model. He's very clever. So they have to anticipate the, you see, the, 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 the quotation of the, the market shares, the value of the market share, just two minutes before somebody else so that they can speculate. And perhaps he might change his mind. I don't know. But I didn't say to him, oh, you should not behave like that. Respect. But in the same way, I have to refer to you that many other people ask me, professor, help us to find a job in a, in, a, in a company or in a firm which follows other rules of behavior. So this is the third reason why we need uh, to expand uh, the cooperative as well as uh, the social enterprise uh, a type of firms. Not because, uh, you see, uh, I do not use other type of arguments. I use uh, the principle of liberty. And you see, what's the point of organizing our society unless this principle of liberty is guaranteed to everybody, at least tendentially? I know that it's impossible exactly 100%, but at least to have a tendency in that direction. I have to conclude because I have finished my time. And uh, I would conclude um, then uh, with uh, coming back to my previous thesis when I said that the civil market economy is what I just said so far. It's a model of organizing the market economy in such a way that pluralism is guaranteed. In other words, uh, different types of enterprises meet different needs and satisfy different needs. Today, we are recuperating that, but we have to run a bit faster because we have lost too much time. Because we, we have been brought to believe that only one type of enterprise, the so-called profit maximizer enterprise or capitalistic type, whatever you want to call, they are necessary, no doubt, but not sufficient. Those who believe that are dogmatic, and I do not like dogmatism. I prefer freedom of thought, etc. So that is why we have, in a sense, to change our, let's say, institutional architecture. What does it mean, institutional? The system of laws, the legal setup, in such a way as to allow the, such a freedom of choice free to be able to choose. In other words, we should ask our political leaders, our legislators, to change, because we have to do, even in my country, in spite of the fact that uh, the cooperative movement in Italy is widely spread, as you know, Italy, in comparison to the population, is the country with the highest percentage of cooperative firms. And most of them, as you know, are leaders in their own sectors of activity. In spite of that, we too need to change the legislative, the legislative, legislative setup because some of the rules are obsolete. We are past 20, 30, 40 years ago, and they are not. So we have to ask our parliament to take that into consideration. That's the same is true, I believe, in this country, which I do not know enough, but from what I have learned from different sources, you too. We have to, but we have to ask uh, the political leaders to adjust the institutional criteria, not because we want to make a favor to one city or that, but because that is a necessity to develop the country in the name uh, of uh, m less inequality, or more justice, which is the same, in the name of democracy and in the name of liberty, etc. Now, to conclude, would one could say, is it this possible? Yes, it is possible. Because, you see, to implement a model, which I call civil market economy model, we do not need more resources. The opposite is true. We obtain more resources in this way. Consider what will happen in the welfare state. Hey, unless we organize a, a civil welfare, there is no way. Because these resources coming from the government, from the public sphere, are doomed to be reduced. And so do we want uh, to give up uh, 
this uh, instrument, the welfare system, which it was originally and still is a, a system of civilization. So the civil market economy, in my opinion, is doomed to advance. And I noticed that in many countries, when uh, we discuss, uh, most people admit that that is a new venue, which is not the venue of those who says that is good, that is bad. No, we need the three principles I've been talking about initially, with no exclusion. So if you want to use the proper word, it's complementarity. We need the complementarity of the free market, of the government, and of the governance the governance mode of regulating transaction. I have reasons to believe that um, in the near future, something important will uh, occur in this direction. For those of you who do not follow, uh, for understandable reasons, the European Union affairs, I can assure you that this is the line which has been officially taken recently by the European, by the European Union, 27 countries. So that must be me. my, let's say, hope and also my, the wish that I, I, I give to you is that Canada, which is a, an important country for understandable reasons, that is a very highly civilized country, should uh, perhaps perform the role uh, of a leader. Even in the United States, these debates is going on. But I'm sure that you can teach something important to your cousin nearby in this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Zamani, for that insightful and thought-provoking talk. You've definitely earned your uh, glass of water. <laughs> We're moving on to our next uh, part of the evening. I just ask that our moderator and our uh, panelists come uh, join us on stage, and I'll take the time to uh, introduce them. Uh, our moderator for this evening is going to be Chris uh, Dobransky. He's been on a panel here before uh, talking on uh, the economy. He's currently Van City's chief economist and the CEO of Citizens Bank, which is a subsidiary of Van City. As chief economist at Van City, Chris develops insights from the economy in service of Van City's vision to redefine wealth and build healthy communities while meeting its members' financial needs. Uh, welcome, Chris. He also uh, has an MA in economics and MBA in finance from uh, UBC. He's done international work that's taken him to Argentina, China, Mexico, and Poland. And in 2002, he too completed the co-op studies program at the University of Bologna in Italy. So uh, welcome, Chris. Uh, Professor uh, Vera Zamagni is also here from, from Bologna. I think she's related to Stefano, of course. <laughs> she's uh, Italy's uh, leading economic historian, senior adjunct professor of international economics, and chair and professor of economic history at the University of Bologna. Uh, she's the former vice president of the Emilia Romagna Regional Government and the former secretary general of the Italian Economic History Society. She's the co founder of the European Review of Economic History, the trustee of the Bologna branch of the Bank of Italy, uh, Dr. Honoris Casa at Umea University in Sweden. She's co authored many books and articles, including Consumer Co ops in Italy and the Economic History of Italy, 1860 to 1990. Welcome, Professor. And next we have uh, Tara McDonald, who is the executive director of the Vancouver Farmers Market. For the past 15 years, Tara has worked in the field of community food system and social enterprise development in Canada and the U.S. In her pursuit of creating a more re resilient regional food system, she's pushed to influence policy at both municipal and provincial levels. As executive director of Vancouver Farmers Markets, she's been a key driver in helping make them one of the largest farmers markets networks in the Pacific uh, Northwest. Uh, welcome to all of you, and I'm going to pass this over to uh, Chris Dobransky to moderate the evening, and all mm -hmm. those uh, microphones you'll be able to pull off and speak right into, so. Okay. They work? Do they work? Yes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for uh, coming to share this uh, debate with uh, your participation. 
Um, benvenuti professori, uh, piacere di vederli qui in Vancouver. Uh, one of the reasons that we brought uh, Tara to the table uh, is that um, in our economy there are certain sectors uh, that are emerging with an awareness of either a, a common purpose, so sharing land for common uh, use, uh, building community in a sense of a public commons, uh, but also a sense of new mutualism, a sense of new interdependence. And so I'm not going to speak to your sector, but I wonder if I could start with you first, if you could explain a little bit of what is uh, the specificity of um, the work that you do in the organic and natural food sector, the community, because then I'm going to call on our guests to opine from uh, an Emilia Romagna viewpoint that has very strong agricultural cooperatives. Well, how do you see this story emerging and what's the history and perhaps start the conversation um, on that basic ingredient? Thank you very much for that question, and um, uh, it's very nice to be here tonight. Um, I, uh, I guess, uh, and you can just sort of let me know if I'm not answering your question. Um, we work in a sector of um, uh, farmers, uh, producers, and value-added processors principally. And uh, British Columbia has uh, the largest number of small-scale, small-lot farmers uh, than any other province in Canada. So we have over 25,000 small farmers uh, in British Columbia, and this is the way farming has been done for generations uh, in this province. Um, and individually, these farmers are not um, very uh, competitive. Uh, they don't have the economies of scale uh, when they're on their own, trying to market their products, distribute their products. Um, and so... Um, and it, it, we also do have a history of um, marketing cooperatives, uh, farmers' cooperatives, uh, particularly in the Okanagan. They existed till about 25 years ago, uh, um, uh, growing and packing their own apples, for example, and tree fruits, and then exporting them. Um, we don't have this uh, infrastructure any longer, though. And so um, uh, a large part of what we do is we help... Um, bring uh, producers together with buyers and just allow them to um, uh, do what they do best, which is to sell their products, uh, allow consumers to come in and buy direct from farmers. What the impact of all of this is, is, um, well, just to um, put it historically, when we started farmers markets back in 1995, we had one farmers market. Uh, and operated uh, one day a week in the commercial drive area of Vancouver. Um, and there were about 14 farmers there, and about 1,000 people came each week. And at the end of that summer, about $50,000 was generated for those farmers. And they went back to their farms, and they said, well, you know, I think this farmer's market idea works for us as small farmers, um, trying to get our products out there to uh, the public. Um, so that was $50,000 in impact that year for them. And then... The year after year, they came back. Our organization developed as a nonprofit, member-driven society, so we're not a cooperative, um, but um, many of our farmers are. Um, and uh, since then, um, we have built our impact to developing and allowing for farmers markets to exist uh, year-round, no longer just six months of the year. Um, we deal with about 225 uh, different vendors now. We see about a quarter of a million people a year. And just last year, uh, our economic impact directly to the farmers was $6.3 million. And uh, if you look at the indirect and the spin-off impact that we have in our communities, um, it runs to the tune of about $13 million. So uh, what we have created is we've, we've brought together uh, interested communities of people, producers and buyers, and allowed them to come together uh, in a way that is uh, um, producing change for our small farmers in British Columbia. And so I wonder if you would, listening to this development of mutuality without necessarily a formal cooperative structure, offer your observations of 
in Italy what works in the agricultural cooperative and as you listen to this story. Mm -hmm. Yes, we uh, have two areas in Italy that are, are, have um, farming highly cooperativized. More than 60% of the farmers uh, work in cooperatives uh, and for cooperatives. Um, this is Emilia Romagna and also Trentino. And the strength of uh, um, the organization is due to the fact that they uh, have joined uh, the uh, farming side with uh, the processing side, so we can really speak of agro-industry and not only of farming, no? uh, so that they can internalize uh, the, the, the profits not only from selling their, their produce, uh, but also from uh, the processing of it. Uh, and uh, they've been so strong uh, in recent times uh, that uh, during the crisis uh, they have been able uh, to increase exports. Uh, so that uh, is one of the very few branches uh, of uh, activity in Italy that uh, has been flourishing over the, over the crisis. And the reason is that uh, they uh, have, have been able uh, to increase uh, um, spe specialization of of certain lines of specialization in farming uh, so that they uh, think, for instance, uh, of Parma cheese, just to make an example, you know. Uh, most of the Parma cheese is uh, organized in uh, cooperatives or consortia, better to say, uh, so that they can uh, control the quality and uh, then have uh, control also of foreign markets, but this is not uh, is only an example of the very many uh, lines that they can take. And uh, um, it has been incredible, even for Italians, you know, that in the crisis they could increase. We are uh, at the, the, the level of several billion uh, euros uh, of, of, of production every year. Uh, only in Emilia Romagna, I know for certain, there is 30 billion. You know, uh, which is produced by uh, cooperatives, uh, uh, both uh, in, in the original uh, crops producing and also in uh, the processing of it, say wine, for instance. Half of the Italian wine, which is the largest exporter of wine now in the world, is produced by cooperatives. Just to, to make an example, but olive oil also, and dairy products, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And as you listen to the evolution of these small individual farmers and now through the farmer's market coming together, how does that strike you in terms of impact? Well, we also in have in Italy some uh, so-called so farmer markets in terms of what we call zero kilometer no? uh, uh, way of uh, selling. In, mean, meaning that the far, farmers come directly to the nearby cities uh, and uh, will uh, sell directly to the consumers. But this is a tiny marginal <laughs> aspect mm -hmm. of the entire process, uh, which is uh, organized uh, on a much larger scale by the cooperatives. Mm -hmm. In uh, the last year or two, uh, many provincial governments have been quite influenced by the financial crisis that they've observed and have adopted from the community the concept of community bonds and community corporations. And I recall that there was a notion of property called the commons. Can you talk a little bit about, in your view of civil uh, economy and civil society, if you were going to place emphasis, as you did today, on civil economy with the cooperative, how does the community benefit if they go with the seem to be the current attainable uh, policy uh, directive of community bonds and commons? Is, no, no, it's, it's for you. <laughs> it's not me. Trust me, it's not that me. That's for you. I will add something later. <laughs> I never mind, I mean, talk about <laughs> I am in favor of fairness. Now, 
Yes, uh, I know uh, the, this recent development concerning the emergence of uh, community corporation, as they are called uh, in uh, this part of the world, in States and Canada. In Italy, for the first time, exactly four years ago, uh, was created a new type of cooperative, which is called community cooperative. And, uh, so it's nice to see the analogies, community corporations, community cooperatives. The logic is the same, even though the mode of functioning is a bit uh, different. In any case, uh, apart from these uh, the operating differences, the basic principle is the following, that uh, the welfare state today is no longer sustainable. That is financially sustainable. That is something that we have to, as economists, we have to explain to people. So, why is that so? Because the curve representing the government revenues, it's a sort of a linear curve. And the slope of this uh, line is what is called uh, fiscal pressure. And the fiscal pressure cannot continue to increase. The opposite is true, we tend to decrease because for understandable reasons. On the other hand, the curve representing the increase of the costs of the welfare services is, has the forms of a hyperbola, hyperbolic, or exponential, better to say. It's an exponential curve. So if uh, now here there is no, no blackboard, but suppose to visualize in front of your eyes a line, straight line, and an, an hyperbola or an exponential curve. On the horizontal axis, you put the time. The gap between the two curves is doomed to increase year after year because the cost of the welfare services are doomed to increase, in particular in the health sector. On the other hand, the revenues, even supposing that there is no tax evasion no, and no corruption, Which is even not. supposing okay, so. that there is no tax evasion or corruption, uh, the gap is doomed to increase. So it is obvious that uh, since we want a, a welfare services which are, uh, uh, let's say, acceptable by everybody, we have to admit that the old model welfare state uh, is no longer sustainable. So now, what we are proposing in different parts of, of the world is the transition from welfare state to welfare society. Welfare society. So the, adject, the, the noun remains welfare. What is the adjective changes? Now, society is made up, you have to consider society as a triangle. In a triangle, you have three vertexes. One vertex represents uh, the public entities, such as uh, government, commune, municipalities, etc., what are called the uh, public bodies. The second uh, vertex of the triangle represents the sphere of the so-called business community. In other words, uh, the sphere of all the uh, type of enterprises. And the third vertex represents the sphere of the so-called civil society organization, such as voluntary, such as uh, what Yara was uh, explaining in her experience, etc. So society is not the state. The state is part of the society, but does not nullify the other two. So the idea of the welfare society is exactly that. We have to put in a sort of interrelation the three spheres, because each one of the three spheres has a specific vocation, a specific duty, and specific resources. And in this sort of a dialogical approach, they have to define the services and to find the mode of financing them. Now, come to the question. Community corporation is an example, not the only one, but it's an important example of the transition from the welfare state to the welfare society, which means that it is the community which can be identified with a small community or a large community, according to the case, which is taking care of certain services. 
not everything, but a certain. Because, for instance, in the health sector, has a certain necessity different from the educational sector, etc. So, this um, the advent of the community corporation on in Italy of community cooperatives is another sign of what I was saying before, namely the reemergence of the civil market economy. In other words, we have to put to work civil society. We cannot consider civil society as an aside or as something uh, substantially relevant, but it has to enter into the scene in a dialogical relationship with the other two entities. Because, you see, the world of the business community, they have money, I can assure you. <laughs> they have money. And the point is that sometimes eh, they do not want to be a bit more specific. I always suggest to those people working uh, in the uh, civil society organization, non-profit organization, for instance, NGOs, uh, non-governmental organizations, never ask to an entrepreneur money directly. You should never. That is a terrible mistake. I have been uh, president of the Italian uh, uh, Agency for Non-Profit Organization. Uh, which is uh, similar to the charity commission in, uh, in England or similar agency. So I know quite a bit of that, that sector. You see, for, for many, many years, I have also created uh, uh, university courses to teach that. Never, what do you, I suggest, you have to ask to an entrepreneur, to an actual entrepreneur, not philanthropy, give me money. You have to ask him, give me your intelligence and your capabilities in order to figure out what is the best way to solve this problem. We have homeless, we have desperate people, we have a elite, almost illiterate in new areas, in particular with the migrants, immigrants, illiteracy. Degree. So we have this problem. You have to tell us how would you solve. Give us your experience. When the entrepreneur is involved, then he will also open the purse and give the money. <laughs> yes, that has been documented. But if you treat the entrepreneur as a sort of, a, how do you say, a saving box where you go and collect money, they will give you that money once, the first time or twice, but then they stop. On the other hand, we have to get them involved. Because if something goes wrong in a community, such as Vancouver, we are here in Vancouver, the whole, everybody is worse off, even the entrepreneurs. Because if there is social upheavals, or if the quality of life deteriorates, everybody will be worse off, not only the poor fellows which is obvious, but even uh, the, other, the, the families uh, living around in the territory, even the enterprises, because then they, when they go to hire people to put to work, uh, they will hire people with the wrong attitude. So we have to make this uh, clear uh, to, uh, to the people. And the same is true with uh, civil society organization. They should become social entrepreneurs. That is the point, social entrepreneur, because they know better than anybody else what are the actual needs of the people, or one type of that. So we have to ask them not simply to be mere executor. That is too easy to execute or to obey to the orders given by us. But they should also become creative in, uh, first of all, understanding the areas of acute needs, and secondly, to provide an indication of solution. The same is true for the public authorities, because the public authorities cannot be excluded, because that would be dangerous from another point of view. So the idea of uh, the community uh, corporation, in my opinion, capture this new uh, mode of solving the problem of wealth, because the problem of wealth is a very serious, more serious than we believe. Because, uh, as you know, the welfare state was um, the great intuition of a great economist, John Maynard Keynes. John Maynard. He was the theoretician. Because 
you know, I bet with you. <laughs> Ask the economists that you, whom you know. If they have a read or if they have a quoted, the most important essay by John Maynard Keynes, which was published in 1939. The title is Welfare and Democracy. Oh, everybody quotes the general theory or the treatise on money, which is okay. But why nobody quotes that article, which is a long essay, more than an article, <laughs> and which is a fundamental, which is fundamental. That is where the foundations of the welfare state uh, were laid down. But Keynes in that article says, now we are in a period of war. In 1939, there was the war going on. And Beveridge, Lord Beveridge, was able to pass the famous package in 42, still at the time of war. So Keynes said, now we have to give to the state all the power because we are in an emergency situation. But sooner or later, the state should give way to the society. And so he was anticipating the transition from welfare state to welfare society. What happened? That he passed away a bit prematurely. And since uh, he passed away, his disciples misinterpreted him. They said, he said, uh, welfare state, let us keep welfare state forever. That is the tragedy. Because Keynes did not want forever. Because he was intelligent. He knew that the welfare state, uh, state, state means government, sooner or later would have become uh, non-sustainable from a financial point of view. That is why he said, now I repeat, in the period of war, there is no other alternative, or in a period of emergency. But in a normal situation, the whole society should organize itself. And the whole society is made up of three vertexes, not only one vertex or one sphere, three spheres. So I salute the, the development of community corporation as well as a B corporation. In America, they have created the B corporation. B stands for benefit. benefit. And they are creating, in the next perhaps few months, a new type of enterprises which they called participatory non-profit corporations in the US. Participatory, which is very similar not equal, similar to the community uh, corporation. Now, all these facts uh, indicate that the, even in the United States, there is a growing consensus uh, in moving towards uh, what they call civil market economy. So I'll just make one more observation and invite your questions. Uh, so think about your questions. Um, it, I want to connect with this insight that we have in the, community uh, corporations or community cooperatives, but then what would be the dignity of work in such, a, in such an environment? And Tara, I wonder if you would share a little bit of what, what's passionate about y your work for you and about the milieu uh, that you draw from? And Vera, what are the basics in a good civil society of work and dignity? Uh, well, I think that for us, um, within our organization, and this, we have many, many stakeholders in our organization, uh, farmers, small value-added processors, uh, fishers, artisans, um, our staff, our volunteers, um, and I think for all of us, it's about uh, the dignity is there in, in um, being able to do, to make a difference and to be able to do what you do best. Farmers can um, farm and produce the most amazing products, which we then have direct access to. Um, we can talk to them directly. Um, and processors have access to those products so then they can process according to, um, you know, their their passions, their interests. And we're always seeing uh, this, this uh this great turning out of amazing products, an incredible amount of innovation, ingenuity, creativity. And I think that's at, really at the bottom of it, is, is the ability to be creative uh, uh, as humans and to contribute that and to share that creativity uh, with all of those folks that make up our, those diverse folks that make up our community. So there's many, many different 
um, um, people involved in. And we say, we say it, it, it takes a community to run a farmer's market. Uh, and certainly, it's, it's, it, that's so true. It's not just the farmers. It's not just the, the staff at, at our, uh, our organization or the board members or the volunteers it's, and, and the shoppers. Uh, it's everybody. It's the businesses that are involved and um, the local decision makers, the politicians in the city and, and regionally. It's just everyone finding their place and, and it resonates with everyone. I think for us too, it's about food. And if there's one thing that binds people together on a common level, it doesn't matter what their background is, their po political persuasion, their religious beliefs... Um, at the end of the day, it's we all eat, and and it's the food that really um, binds us together, and and our ability to to show our passion through food. Yes, um, I would be inclined in saying that we could add a fourth re reason why we need more cooperatives. Uh, Stefano spoke of uh, fighting against inequalities. Uh, uh, avoiding a lack of democracy and increasing liberty, I would add jobs. Because uh, the tendency of uh, our capitalist world is towards a jobless growth. Why? Because um, uh, two are the possibilities. One is substituting uh, people with machinery, uh, machinery are much more docile than people, you know. They <laughs> never complain. Maybe sometimes uh, they are broken, you know, but they can be adjusted, uh, and that's it, you know. Uh, uh, but people instead... Uh, and, and so there's a tendency, in fact, to substitute uh, uh, with machinery, or, or to substitute people who want uh, to have uh, their dignity... Uh, recognized uh, with uh, people who are in no conditions uh, to ask for this uh, in uh, less developed countries uh, and accept uh, any, any uh, small money um, provided that they can have a job. I, I think you have read in newspapers uh, recently what has happened uh, in Bangladesh, if I remember well, you know, in which uh, an entire uh, building uh, uh, came down and killed uh, several hundreds uh, of the workers who were working inside, you know, because uh, uh, probably too many people inside that old building. And uh, this um, reminded me a similar case that happened in the United States uh, some century ago, one century ago, uh, in, in, in which pretty similar uh, situation uh, and most of the women who were working in that factory in uh, the United States were coming from Italy, and they were textile workers. Uh, and this is the reason why I, I remember this uh, similar case. So th the point is this, that if uh, we only uh, have uh, um, uh, corporations that would uh, maximize uh, uh, profits for, uh, for shareholders, uh, they tend to minimize anything else. And what they are minimizing in this particular period of time are jobs for people, and, uh, and good jobs also for people. You know, because, uh, again, uh, to survive to the so-called uh, uh, international competition, uh, which is based in, uh, uh, on using... Uh, uh, low uh, wages uh, as uh, as low as possible no? uh, to survive on this sometimes even in our advanced countries uh, uh, there is a tendency to pay workers less uh, or uh, to get uh, rid of them as I was saying before so this third reason uh, this fourth reason I think it is terribly important you know if we want to have uh, um, uh, people treated in, in, in a reasonable way and um, supported in uh, the possibility to um, um, use their talents, uh, we have to have more cooperatives and there is no alternative to this. You know, or non-profit organizations, certainly, but I mean, in general, the cooperatives are capable of organizing them themselves in a very efficient way because one thing that we have to say is that it's not necessary that um, 
uh, a non-corporate organization might, must be inefficient. It's not necessary, this. No. It depends on how things are organized. Uh, certainly, it is obviously true that uh, in, in a number of cases, uh, cooperatives, are either because uh, of uh, the democratic uh, activities that they have to have inside, uh, or because precisely because they pay uh, more, their workers or their suppliers uh, have higher costs. But if they are careful in producing uh, um, also the high, more specialized things, uh, high quality things, uh, then they can make up for the difference in costs. And this, I think, is the, a, a very important strategy for uh, cooperatives, you know, because uh, they probably cannot survive uh, a competition, an international competition, if they produce highly standardized uh, products, uh, low quality products, uh, but they can instead uh, survive much better if they are specializing in things that have high quality, high quality uh, uh, in technical meaning, but also high quality in, say, a cultural meaning, because uh, um, they provide, uh, to, to make an example, in the farming, in, in the farm market, uh, um, uh, products that are very traditional for the place and not so standardized, you know, and uh, that have also uh, a, a, a cultural tradition attached to them, no? and uh, if they do this, uh, they uh, meet the preferences of many people no? who uh, understand that our future is in quality and not in quantity. No? So it's just the opposite uh, to, to Walmart. Walmart yeah. no? <laughs> just the opposite to Walmart. No? So we turn it over to your questions, and there are a couple of mics on either end, please. Uh, I have a question uh, for Professor Stefano. Uh, with the decline, with the running out of cheap oil, would you say that uh, the civil market economy has a better, better condition for growth? Why, uh, and would you anticipate that the Walmart corporation will go into decline because they don't have the, the, uh, the means to transport goods over long, uh, over a vast distance of ocean? So the question is, uh, given the finite carbon uh, and oil supplies, does a civil economy in the long run have more capacity than a global economy because of shipping, transportation, and the dependence on a resource that is uh, dwindling. But, 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 but those energy resources can be substituted by s s something else. You know? uh, I'm not sure, I'm, uh, I'm not not sure, sure that not I have grasped the correct, but I try to to answer in the way I have understood. You see, the civil economy is it's not something different from the market economy, as I said at the beginning. It's a particular way to organize uh, the, the functioning of the market economy in order to exploit all the pos potentialities which exist uh, in a society. So the three vertexes I was talking about. In particular, if you want the but it is obvious that uh, in a short presentation it is impossible to clarify uh, the whole issue. What is typical of the civil market economy is to put to work the principle of reciprocity. Now, as we know, actually I was explaining this morning uh, in the, to, the, to the people uh, taking... Uh, uh, the Sam Bologna Sam program from Van City. Any social order is based uh, upon three principles. Any social order. The principle of exchange of equivalence, the principle of redistribution, and the principle of reciprocity. Now, reciprocity is different from the exchange of equivalence. Because otherwise, what's the point of having two different names? What, the point... Uh, <laughs> 
The point is that uh, the, the neoliberal market economy and the social market economy, they always, 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 I said it three times, uh, stresses the first two principles. And they never talk about the third principle. The civil market economy endeavors to put in uh, interaction the three principles. And I always say to somebody who is not familiar, with, go and check in any textbooks of economics whether or not the principle of reciprocity is quoted. Never, never, never. Uh, only in the last 10, 15 years. And nowadays, in the last 10, 15 years, we are already observing some hundred books uh, dealing with uh, reciprocity in economics, eh? not in sociology or in psychology, which always existed. So the question is why economists as a group, of course, never devoted enough attention to the principle of reciprocity? That is the big question. In other words, uh, the civil market economy is trying to resurrect this principle. And this principle of reciprocity is the principle which is uh, typical, but not exclusive, of the cooperative firm. Another area, another entity where the reciprocity principle is put to, into action is what? The family. How would you describe the relationship between uh, the members of a family, uh, parents and children, brothers and sisters, etc., husband and wife. Would you describe that as a relation of exchange of equivalence? Sometimes it is the case, but that uh, is a uh, then the family collapse. Or would you describe that uh, in terms of uh, hierarchy? Sometimes it's the case, but that is nowadays is never accepted. In the past it was like that. The, the head of the family, which was typically the man, he was like the government. He has to decide. But that is not the proper way of working by family. Because the family is based upon the principle of reciprocity, whereby I help you today and you will help me tomorrow. I, I, I help you in a way and you might help me tomorrow in another way, according to the principle of proportionality not of equivalence. So that is why it's different from the exchange of equivalence. Exchange of equivalence means market price. means that uh, if you want uh, this pen from me, you have to give me the, to pay me the price. Otherwise, I will not be. The reciprocity is not like that. Now, if you ask yourself, ask some members of cooper cooperation, how is the relationship among the members of a cooperative? It's a, a relation of reciprocity. Where there is no... The, that, that is why Vera said before, cooperative are job-creating entity. Because you see, in a cooperative, a worker, a person who works, is not only, not only a means of production, as we say, a factor of production in the production function, input-output. It's also that, but it's a person. And person has a, his or her own specificity, problem, etc. So the members of cooperatives tend to apply mutuality, and mutuality is a particular instance of reciprocity. So to conclude, the civil market economy, which existed initially, eh, because they, <laughs> the point is that we do not study history, but until the end of the 18th century, until the end of the 18th century, the model of a market economy was a civil but then it was uh, overshadowed by the first industrial revolution, which uh, modified completely for understandable reason, etc. So, in conclusion, the civil market economy does not exclude the first two principles, because we need exchange of equivalence, we need redistribution, but we also need reciprocity, because people, I keep on saying, spend most of their living time inside productive organization. And that is, a, it's been calculated that two-thirds of our living time of an adult person is spent inside an organization, productive or of one type or the other. So unless we modify a bit the working of this organization, 
life will become difficult, not for the lack of money, but for the lack of possibility of expanding the personality. Because to be treated like a machine is not nice. I can assure you, in the long run, people get either fed up or they might get into depression, as we know, etc., etc. So that is the novelty. Because when that is acquired, we will observe that even from an economic point of view, the situation improves. Why is that so? Because today we live in a society which is called knowledge society. Knowledge today is the key factor. But ask ourselves, let us ask ourselves, what is the nature of the knowledge creation? The nature is cooperation, not competition. And in fact, eh, the recent results of the literature on this shows that. That is why, because the, the, usual, the usual saying, if I know something and I communicate that something to you, at the end, two people know before only one. But I do not lose my knowledge. On the other hand, if I give you this pen, then I will no longer have it. Which means that uh, the nature of knowledge is basically a common good, what is called commons, a common good. And uh, the treatment of commons presupposes the application of the cooperative, as I said before, principle, not competition. Because competition is good when you have to deal with commodities, with things. But when you have to do with ideas, project, you need cooperation. Because I externalize to you my idea, you as a feedback uh, give, come back to me with a, a modification, and uh, this type of approach uh, at the end generates uh, new things, important things. That is a point which, uh, that is why the United States, they are substituting individual competition with intergroup competition. And it has been proved empirically that those groups where inside the group there is cooperation, ceteris paribus, they always win against another group where competition is applied inside the group. That is em empirically proved. And it makes sense. Just to give the stupid example, consider football, soccer. If you have a team, 11 player, each one of them is super, perfect, very good. But unless they cooperate among themselves, the team will not win, even though each one of them is a, what? Maradona. I don't know if Maradona was considered very, very good, etc. I'm not an expert in that. Here is actually in the knowledge area, research area is the same. We need the cooperation. That is why they, you see the research center tends to modify the rule. If you put competition, me against you, I will try to subtract knowledge from you, to steal, or I will never convey to you. The result is that we will never produce a new. That is why the cooperative type of organization today is instrumental to produce more knowledge. In other words, uh, to advance the frontier of our knowledge. That is what the civil market economy is uh, trying to. That is why, as I said, uh, it, these ideas are spreading in many different countries. Because if you think like that, it makes sense. It's not something. On the other hand, uh, the, the other mode, uh, the so-called capitalistic mode, was okay in the past. It is true. At the time of the Tayloristic mode of production. You know Taylor. Taylor published his book in 1911. It was a major success. Because the Tayloristic mode of production, as you know, was based on military rule. In the military world, the general gives an order to the coroner, coroner to the captain, like this. In the Tayloristic mode, it was the same. The top if of the hierarchy in the, within the firm gives order. The other one has to obey. Now, that model, which was uh, you know, the best result, was the assembly line. 
Taylor invented the assembly line, invented in the sense that uh, he was an engineer who was able to produce the model. And the assembly line was a great success. Consider the case of Henry Ford, etc. The, the, the mass production. But nowadays, that model does not work. Why? Because today we need creativity. Because we have to base, as Vera said before, on quality, not on quantity. We cannot continue to produce more and more and more of the same things. Because that, no way. If you produce the same type of things, or commodities, or in, in larger quantities, you reach the ceiling. What we have to operate is on the quality, because the quality wins today against yesterday, quantity. That is why the cooperative mood or the cooperative mode of production today is gaining more ground. And the cooperative firm is just an extrinsication of this cooperative model. So these are not fantasies. These are things which really happen in reality. It's enough for you to go and visit a research center. You will see that today the research center in areas such as medicine, biology, chemistry, etc., are based on the cooperative model. That is the point. There is somebody else. Any other question? It's nine already. <laughs> we'll probably take one more question. Because they are hungry and they want to go yeah. to eat. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Second floor, don't forget. Thanks. Uh, my question's for the whole panel. Um, if we are moving towards a knowledge economy, uh, what happens when corporations are privatizing knowledge through patents and using the state to uh, crush knowledge sharing, illegalizing knowledge sharing? And how do cooperatives compete with corporations that have such massive economies of scale? Uh, and when the corporations are able to attract more private investment because their bottom line is giving more profits to their investors, whereas the cooperative's bottom line is social justice and democracy. Thanks. Of course, thank you. This is a very important question. That is, thank you for me. <laughs> because this uh, is uh, one of the most uh, challenging uh, questions from an intellectual point of view. The question is, if in a market environment, a cooperative firm has to compete with corpor a corporate firm or corporation. What is going to happen? Now, the answer to this question is contained in the co in, in a old concept which was introduced for the first time by Aristotle, the great philosopher Aristotle, when he talked about the fragility of good. In recent time, an American philosopher, Martha Nussbaum, is the only professor of chair professor in the United States of philosophy in, in Chicago University. She has the chair. A few years ago, she has written a major book whose title is The Fragility of Good. And she starts from Aristotle and brings uh, his ideas to present day. And one chapter of that big book, uh, deals exactly with your question. The idea of the fragility of good is the following, to be very a bit simplistic for reasons of time. That good uh, is infinite, but fragile. Bad or evil, it's uh, finite, but robust. <laughs> so you understood. The implication is, if we want, if we have reason to believe or if we have reason to prefer the good to the evil, we should know that the good is fragile, and so we needs to be protected. That was their conclusion. <laughs> Coming to your question, you understand immediately. It is obvious that if in a market setup you put a, a cooperative and a corporation dealing with the same uh, type of activity sector, 
to compete, it is obvious that the corporation will win. Why? Because the corporation will be able to use certain strategies that are prevented to a cooperative. For instance, a corporation can always use, in case of necessity, one strategy which is called exploitation. That, that is known. Or firing workers. Or, or fire workers. In case, a cooperative will not do. Second, a corporation will delocalize. Co cooperatives never delocalize. You know what is delocalization? If a corporation uh, producing whatever, the, uh, observe that uh, transferring the plants uh, in that country, Pakistan, India, or China, etc., where the cost of labor is uh, infinitely lower than, they will do it. A cooperative cannot do it because it's prevented by its own nature. Because uh, cooper cooperatives are embedded in the territory, are embedded in the community. So they will never do that. In this crisis in Italy, cooperative, Italian cooperatives never fired no, one, one single, single person yeah. in this crisis. Whereas all the corporations, they fired, yes. you, you know, we have a, several hundred thousand. We have several, uh, we have 20 rate, uh, 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 an employment rate of more than 20%. Uh, but that people. was created not by the cooperative. The cooperative didn't fire. They said, look, uh, we have to reduce our home benefits, but we have to keep to work these people. They have a family, they have children, blah, 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 etc. In other words, uh, it is obvious that a corporate, capitalistic corporation has instruments which uh, cannot be utilized by cooperative. Conclusion, if we really are serious people and honest, serious and honest, we have to consider that competition is acceptable when it is fair. And fair competition means uh, that uh, you cannot treat a different entity in the same way. That is uh, unfairness. You cannot put in the ring uh, a, 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 a child uh, competing with uh, a giant. That is unfair. That is why we have the rules of the game. And here is the same. So that is why the notion of fragility of good has to be applied, which does not mean that uh, the the legislative power, the parliament, has to favor. It's not a matter of favor. It's a matter of being fair, not favoring. Because if I know that the corporation, for instance, a corporation has access to speculative markets, a cooperative does not have such an access. So it is unfair to put to compete one against the other. I am in favor of competition, provided that it is fair. And so, Case by case, we have to judge when that particular situation has to be dealt with. But uh, the important point is to stop with the stupid game of many economists who talk about competition. Because ask them what does it mean, the word competition. They do not know. <laughs> competition, it's a word coming from Latin. In Latin, is cum petere. This is a fact. Uh, cum petere in Latin means uh, tending together to the same objective. Uh, the objective being the common good uh, of, the, of the polity, of the society, etc. That is the proper meaning of competition. It's not uh, that I have to destroy you. That is not competition. That is Darwinian <laughs> competition, yeah. which brings uh, the end of society. So we have to start talking this language because this, and if one is ignorant, has to learn, even though he's a professor, because it's intolerable that many professors of economics, uh, they, uh, they preach it uh, without no, not even knowing the meaning of the words they are using. That's not tolerable because everybody should be humble enough to know what does not know and to learn, we are on purpose. Because on this idea of competition, we have created tremendous injustices. Why did I talk before about inequality increasing? You know, just a sort of um, journalistic uh, uh, phrases. 
you know, it has been estimated in the year 1970, in the United States, the ratio between those that mostly paid inside the corporation, the least paid was 1 to 100. 1 to 100. 1 to 100. In 1970. In other words, the CEO received a salary 100 times higher than the last worker. In the year 2005, the data uh, we are collecting, the year 2005, which means after 35 years, do you know what was the ratio in the United States between the, high, the mostly highly paid and the least? One to 700. Yes, 100, 1,700. Now, you can conclude whatever you want to conclude. This is a, we are talking of the same country, of the same industrial sector, etc. Now, it is intolerable then to talk about competition under these conditions. It's almost ridiculous. So, we have to fight for fair competition. Because under fair competition, everybody gets what he or she deserves provided that the conditions are fair. That is my answer to you. Yes, I have a small there, thing please. to add. Yeah, uh, give you the last uh, word. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I never joined Steph, with Stefano normally, you know, because... Uh, <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> We have a rather separate life in terms of uh, public speak because it is impossible <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> Anyhow, I want to, to add this. Because I am the cook in the family. <laughs> because she, she is a disaster. Eh? <laughs> Never. Some people here can testify. Piacere, that. piacere. We, and uh, the, the small addition is the following. Precisely because of what Stefano said that... Uh, uh, cooperatives uh, are fragile in terms of competition. Uh, we need some legislation that helps them, not helps them in terms of subsidizing them, you know, but helps them in, in a way to allow them to uh, be uh, on, on a par situation with the other firms in terms of competition. So, sort of compensation for the expenditures that they have, uh, uh, extra expenditures in terms of uh, uh, having more democracy, treating better the, 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 their workers, and so on and so forth. So, so it is fair to have a, a legislation that helps cooperatives because it uh, produces a, a, a fairer competition, but also uh, the second thing in my mind that uh, even more important is that cooperatives must know this. And therefore, they, have, uh, they need to strengthen themselves in terms of uh, uh, networks that they have to build uh, that allows them to uh, become uh, stronger, not as single cooperatives, but as movements uh, as, as entire movements. They have to build federations, uh, they have to build consortia, they have to build groups in such a way as to provide those uh, uh, economies that they cannot provide inside because they're smaller generally and also for the reasons, other reasons that were mentioned, over the entire movement. Uh, and, and this, I think, is terribly important. Otherwise, uh, really, it would be too difficult for, for cops uh, to compete, to have uh, some support by legislation and to understand that they have to strengthen themselves uh, through uh, networks, uh, very, very tight networks. So thank you, Vera. Thank you, Tara and Stefano. I hope you've observed the authentic exchange and this creative, <laughs> creative view. And wherever you are on your journey, whether you're you're in a social enterprise or interested in just community building or a member of Van City in supporting living wage to strengthen social equity as we did today. Um, do join us and this has been an honor to uh, participate with you in this exchange. Thank you very much.